Good evening. I would like to begin this event by acknowledging the continuous presence of indigenous peoples, communities, and culture on this land for over 10,000 years. We stand on Nipmuc land, and I acknowledge our neighboring indigenous nations, the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. My name is Tim Johnson. I have the distinct pleasure of being the director of the Botanic Garden here. Uh, show openings are really special times. It's, it's a huge celebration of a lot of work. Uh, we've already started planning for next year's mum show, so there's no rest in sight. Uh, and the other thing I've been thinking a lot about as we look at the last two months of this decade uh, is all the things that I'm thankful for. Um, and one of them is this event, this amazing community, all of you who show up for these events to support us. Uh, I want to make sure that you know that after this, please join us in Lyman Conservatory for a preview of the Mum Show. I have to thank a few people who've made this show uh, possible. First and foremost is Dan Babineau, who's our horticulturalist, who, yes, please, please, please. <laughs> Dan has brought us something truly unique and, and very different than what we've done in the past. There are over 40 handcrafted, uh, shaped, and trained chrysanthemums that he's been working for 10 months on. Uh, a true labor of love. I also have to thank Steve Sojkowski, who's been working side by side with Dan to make this show possible. Uh, thank you. And then there's a, an additional cast uh, of support, our 2019 summer interns, our work study students, Selena Lewis Bartley, Bridget McNeil, and Allison Shoebottom. I also want to thank last year's horticulture students who created the huge selection of new hybrids that you get the chance to vote on your favorites. So please join us afterwards uh, for light refreshments and also to view our current exhibit, The Art and Science of Dying about Natural Plant Dyes. This is an incredible exhibit brought to life by our manager of education, Sarah Loomis, and local fabric artist, Michelle Parrish. It's a, a truly incredible exhibit. I'm really proud of this. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is if you aren't already staying in contact with us digitally, you can go to our website and on the upper right hand corner of the page, I'll give you the, I'll give you the link in a second, is a e-newsletter. You can sign up for free to get Digitalis and stay up to speed with us with our quarterly e-newsletter. How many of you, and would you raise your hand if you were one of our friends of the Botanic Garden members? Thank you all very much. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, these are the folks who brought your donuts and cider this evening. <laughs> Uh, I want to make an unreasonable request. I've made this request before, which is to become a member of the Botanic Garden. Individual memberships for an entire year start at just $50, and there's lots of reasons to become a member, uh, because our programming speaks to you, because we're here to help you learn, as well as the Smith College community to learn, because it's great for our community to be able to come together at events like this or simply because you like gardens, that's okay too. I also want to acknowledge our volunteers. Would you raise your hand if you're one of our volunteers? Can we give a round of applause please for our volunteers? <laughs> Last year, our volunteers contributed over a thousand hours of service, including giving almost a hundred tours to school-age kids. Over 2,500 school-age kids came through our tours. They are what allows us to stay open on the weekends. They are what allow us to have expanded hours during the mum show. So thank you volunteers so very much. You give us so much. I'm greatly appreciative. Um, and with that, I want to introduce Sarah Loomis, who will be introducing our speaker tonight. Sarah is our manager of Ed. And again, when you see the art and science of dying, just remember this is the person that brought that together for us. Hello, everyone. So as Tim said, my name is Sarah Loomis. I am the manager of education at the Botanic Garden. It's a wonderful job. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. With recent news of raging wildfires, a changing global climate, divisive politics, 
not to mention upcoming exams, projects, and papers if you're a student. Maintaining our well-being can feel like an elusive goal. How do we foster mindfulness in our own lives? What role does physical space play in supporting our health? Dr. Yoko Kawai's mission is to create spaces that foster this well-being by utilizing spatial concepts of Japanese architecture and gardens. A lecturer at Yale University, she has taught theories of Japanese architecture since 2010. Dr. Kawai is the co-founder and principal of Penguin Environmental Design based in Hamden, Connecticut, as well as Osaka, Japan. Her firm focuses on bringing landscape into architecture. The firm's major works include a residential project that received a CTC and Innovation and Design Award in 2015, a Zen Garden for the Frost Valley YMCA in New York in 2014, and a Stonescape at the Yale University Art Gallery in 2009. In 2016, her firm co-founded the Mirai Workspace Alliance in New York to bring space for well-being to contemporary workplaces. Tonight, as Dr. Kawai presents the origins and applications of Japanese spatial concepts, we hope that you are brought towards a discovery of your own serene place of well-being. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kawai. Thank you, Stella, for a very nice introduction. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming here tonight. I'd like to thank everyone at the Botanic Garden of Smith College, Tim Johnson, Sarah Smith, I met a lead, a Burton Johnson, and students here. It is my great honor to give a talk at the, at the opening of your annual chrysanthemum show. Earlier today, I and my partner were given the tour of the Smith College, and we were quite impressed how the botanic garden and campus itself, as well as its education program, were integrated to one piece. At the same time, this one piece covers so many fields of landscape and environment. And I hope my talk today could make a small contribution to it tonight. Thank you. I'd like to start this with a small experiment. I'll give you 10 seconds. So I'd like you to imagine that you are in this space as a dancer. This is a, a Jacob's Pillow um, in Berkshire nearby. I hope you, you've been there. So please imagine that you are on the stage as a dancer for 10 seconds. So let's start. Okay, what did you feel? What did your body sense? Did you feel the warmth of the air? It's summer, the photo. Or it maybe feel a little cooler because it was in the afternoon. You might felt the wind on your cheek. At the same time, what did your mind feel? Did you feel the beauty and openness of the space? Were you, perhaps, a little bit happier? So now with this experience, you learned that the space could influence the state of your mind and body. Space has the power to improve your well-being. And we tend to forget that. When we talk about the well-being, we talk about the nutrition, we talk about the exercise, but very scarcely about the space. Then what is well-being exactly? When you are truly well, you are not only physically, psychologically, or spiritually well. You are in good relationship with your family members and friends. And you are in good status economically, financially. 
And these five fields of the, actually the range of fields that are required to be well, according to the definition of WHO, demonstrate the value as well as the range of application of what I would call space for well-being. Space for well-being is the human-centric approach to, as well as the outcome of spatial design. So it is on and around the well-being of individuals, but its influence, its contribution is beyond each of you. It includes the quality and economy of the society. Then, what exactly is space for well-being? There are three ingredients, I would say. One of them is human being. Your body, as well as your mind, are the part of the space. But again, we tend to forget that. But when you imagine that you were on the stage in, at the Jacobs Pillow, I'm sure that you felt that you were the part of the space. And our space is scarcely, it's, it's always moving. You're sitting right now, but your eyelids are moving, your jaw may be moving to look at me, or your fingers might be moving. And that's how our body interacts with the space. So that's the first and central elements or ingredients of space for well-being. And then our body sends the nature in the space, the natural elements in the space. Our eyes not only see the colors of the leaves, for example, we listen to the birds singing, we smell the nice smell of flowers, we touch the coldness of the water, and we taste it. So that's the second ingredient. And then our mind feels something in the space, nature in the space, the characteristic of the space. I'm talking about the beauty and openness that you felt at the Jacob's Pillow. And when we talk about the mind, I'd like to include both the conscious part of our mind, our brain, as well as the unconscious part. So these three are interrelated each other. For example, if you are walking this very nice path surrounded by bamboo in Kyoto, this is the image from Kyoto, and if you're lucky enough to have, a, have your blood pressure decreased when you're walking, then it could be because your mind felt something in the air that made you feel mindful that eventually decreased your blood pressure. Or it could be because your nose sensed the scent of bamboo and that directly decreased your blood pressure. So these three are interrelated each other. And although I like to focus one of the relationships, the relationship between our mind and the nature of the space, please don't forget that there are others because they are equally important. My friends, my students, and my clients often tell me that they become mindful or contemplative when they are in Japanese architecture or garden. <coughs> Mindfulness is one of the description or definition of the good state of the mind. Some even say it's the only description of the good state of the mind. And it means that to be aware on the present moment, um, non-judgmentally. So you don't have to be meditating to be mindful you could be walking. Then, what kind of space make you feel mindful? That's the core question today, and it's very challenging question. 
and we don't we still don't have many scientific uh, information about it also it, you know we're getting there um, but we have a very good strong reliable hint which is how we perceive the space when we are mindful when we are mindful the boundary between the self and space is blurred. In Zen Buddhism, the definition of true mindfulness is the status in which the, uh, you feel as a part of the space, but at the same time, you and the space is separated. And modern Japanese philosophy supports that idea too. Yasuo Yuasa, by interpolating uh, the famous philosopher Kitaro Nishida's idea, said that uh, when we are mindful, the conscious part of our mind settles down. And then our unconscious part of the mind comes up and acts toward the environment directly without responding to the stimulus from the outside. Because neither our body nor the conscious part of our mind interferes into this process, the self and space, the bound, its boundaries are blur. And then in neuroscience, it was found out that in the brains of the meditating monks, the coordination between the internal and external environment increased. Internal meaning the internal of your body and external environment coordination um, increased. So this seems to be true, right? Then is the opposite true. When the boundary between the cell and space is blurred, does that help us being more mindful? Through the years of research on Japanese architecture and gardens, I'm pretty much confident to say that Japanese space make the self-space boundary blah. At the same time, I hope many of you experience that Japanese garden architecture make you feel more mindful. Perhaps, you know, you were at the Japanese garden at the Smith College for the contemplation, and you know that. So, for the rest of my talk, I'd like to introduce you how Japanese space make the self-space boundary law, thus possibly make you feel more mindful. But before I go into that, I really would like you to feel how it is like to lose the self-space boundary. I once asked that question to my students, and one of them said that you could lose the self-space boundary when you are in the water, when you dive into the water. And that's an excellent answer because I hope many of you can relate to that experience, dive into the water. At the same time, we now know why so many of us would like to go to Bermuda for Christmas. <laughs> so um, being under the water makes you lose the self-space boundary, I think from three different directions. One is, when you are under the water, you don't see well because the light reflects in a different way in the water uh, from the way um, the air does. So you don't see well. And then when you are under the water, your surroundings are always moving as, not as a single mass, but as a combination of different colors. That's the second election. And thirdly, when you are under the water, you cannot really stop completely still because water moves you. So that's the three direction. And interestingly, Japanese spatial concept make the self-space boundary blur 
from the exact same direction as the being underwater does. You cannot see well. That's called yugen, the art of untold and unknown. Your surroundings are moving as a combination of different currents. That's called ma and hashi, boundary in motion. And then you cannot stop still because water moves you. It's called utsuroi and michiyuki, changing space and moving still. And I'd like to explain that by using the examples because these are many, a lot. And let me start with the art of untold unknown, yugen. Yugen is the concept that is admired in many different fields of Japanese arts. Here, Kamono Chomei, uh, who is a very well known monk and the poet from 12th century, said that when looking at autumn mountains through mist, the view may be indistinct, yet have great. Depths. The part of the reason, at least a part of the reason why Japanese people admired Yugen, came from Japanese climate. Japan is the series of islands, as you know, on the ocean, so it is always very humid. And then the steep mountains are situated very close to the ocean, so the weather changed quite often. Presenting the image like this in front of your eyes the mist and fog and humid, humidity. So, regardless if it is the poem, paintings, photographs, or no performances, the idea is by not showing all of them, by keeping a part of it mysterious, you can convey much more. And that's the idea of Yugen. And very interestingly, the idea of mysteriousness, the concept of mysteriousness, is one of the very few nature of the space, the characteristic of the space, that is scientifically proved to be good for your well being. How do you make that mysteriousness? This study shows that the contrast between the light and shadow improves the impression of the healing. And it, because it steers your imagination toward the unknown world. That's why we see this contrast of light and shadow in Halloween last night, right? You use that. And here you see、um, a small Japanese courtyard that is typical for a Japanese townhouse. And Japanese gardens and courtyard are almost never just simply bright or just simply dark. It always carries a different combination of the brightness and shadow. Another study showed that people much prefer the image of architecture, regardless to the style of architecture, when a part of it is hidden. So you, here you see the different images. And when I found out this research, it was great shock to me because all through my life, for 30 years, I was trained to design a beautiful piece of architecture, and people much prefer it. When a part of his, it is hidden by trees. <laughs> so the landscape architect wins. My husband is a landscape architect. And in Japanese tea houses, you again see the contrast as well as the manipulation of light and shadow. This is Joan, built in the 17th century, and it is in So An style tea house. And because the So An style tea house is made out of mud walls, the interior tends to be dark. But by 
placing by locating the different kinds of windows, in this case, you know, short screens, um, it, with very intentional ways. The designers of these uh, so on style tea house, often the tea masters, were able to make the uh, lighting condition of the interior an even one. Here on the left hand side, you see the two adjacent windows facing two different directions. They are lighting up the tatami where the guest for the tea ceremony would be sitting. And on the light, you see the. Um, is this working? I hope. Okay. So this is the windows, uh, a window for um, to light up the area where the tea master is going to make a tea. And then you even have the skylight on the left that you need to push up to open it because you know back in 17th century they didn't have a glasses, so you need to open it. But <laughs> you may or may not be open it all the time. <laughs> so the next spatial concept that makes the self-space boundary blob is boundary in motion, and that's called ma. Ma is probably the most well-known Japanese spatial concept, and it presides over many other concepts. Its Chinese character represents the image of a gate made out of two doors and moonlight that comes through it. But Ma is not something that is made out of just two doors and the moonlight. It is something much more um, fluid. And I like to explain that by using this very quick video. Okay, so imagine that red ink represents one space and blue ink represents another, another. And these two spaces continuously work toward each other, creating the published ink on whose shape and color continuously change. And this published color that, cha that changes the color and shape is the image of Ma. And then um, there is another term called hashi, which also refers to the idea of boundary in motion. Um, its general meaning is just edge, an edge. But the pronunciation of hashi came that of uh, a boat or a barge, hashike. Therefore, when you say in Japanese hashi as an edge, it, only, it always carries the sort of underlying image of a boat going in between two shores. Here I'd like you to notice two, two things. One is, because it's a barge, the idea of boundaries are always moving. At the same time, because it's a boat, there's always somebody on it. You are on it. You are on the boundary in motion. And with this same pronunciation of hashi, <coughs> the term hashi refers to four different edge conditions. All of them somehow relate to the architecture and garden. The first one, hashi as periphery, uh, refers to the space that is a little bigger than the sharp edge of hashi, a little more roomier. The second one, hashi as a veranda, is the space where the inside and outside are separated and connected at the same time. And the two others are interesting because bridges and stairs are considered to be the 
elements that go perpendicular to the edge of space, of edge of anything in Western understanding. But in Japanese concept, bridges and stairs are part of the boundary. And I'd like to show all of these five different hashes by using the example of Shokinte Tea House in, um, at the Katsura Imperial Palace in Kyoto, because um, that piece of architecture and garden include all of these hashi. Water is probably the most important element of the design of Katsura Imperial Villa, built, uh, built in 17th century over the many years. The space is designed so that you can enjoy it not only from the land, but from the water. So the boat and boathouse were there from the very beginning. So you are already on Hashi as a, as a barge, as a boat. And in very general, um, hashi as periphery in Japanese, God, uh, Japanese spaces are often made by the man-made elements that are usually open or half transparent. As you can see in two photos on the land, uh, on, on the right-hand side, um, for example, in Itsukushima Shrine, the, uh, the edge of the property is surrounded by the open corridor, so it's open man-made. At the same time, for example, in Toinseki, the gate to the garden is made out of the bamboos that are quite transparent. So these are typical examples of Hashia's periphery in Japanese space. However, in Katsura, where the Shokinte stands, um, we don't see too many of these man-made elements to make the Hashia's periphery. Um, probably with some ex exception like the garden gate that you see here. But you see more instead Hashi as peripherally as the layers of landscape. On the right hand side is the site plan of Katsura in Pialio Villa and the white part is water, or the pond. So you can see how extensive and intricate that water design is. And Shokinte is right there on the sort of a peninsula or island on the right hand side corner. And you are looking at Shokinte from the water on the left hand side of the image. So here, the edge, the peripheral of Shokinte does not have an opaque, clear edge. Instead, what it has is the ground, ground cover first, and then the, the gray road pass, and then the series of lower hedges, which are open. So repeating this sort of open landscape element is one of the tricks that are often, again, prayed to create um, hashi as peripherally in Japanese space. Then, to reach Shokinte Tea House, you have to go over, I think, two bridges. Again, you are on Hashi. Hashi as veranda. At Shokinte Tea House, veranda, a part of the veranda is made into the kitchenette for the tea ceremony that is done inside. And I think this photo really demonstrate how veranda not only separates the outside and inside, but connects them. And here you're looking at the same veranda from the outside. The Japanese verandas are always under the deep eaves, so it's covered, therefore, the activity that takes place inside can easily overflow, you know, spilled over to veranda. At the same time, the, any action that you're taking outside, like walking on this path, could easily 
spilled into the veranda. So veranda not only separates or connecting the spaces, but they are acting as a connector or separator of the actions of human beings. So you are creating this space at the same time. Okay, so next I'd like to talk about the third direction from which the, uh, the being under the water and Japanese space make the self-space boundary blah, which are changing space and the moving self. Changing space is utsuroi, and it means the gradual change. It's actually the gradual inevitable change from one status to the other. It also means the reflection and projection of one thing to the other. So in either case, it implies that everything is in unreliable and everything is ephemeral. The term utsuroi is often used to describe the landscape and symbolize the moment at which the heyday of the person or something or event has just past. So if you use it, for example, for the flowers, it means the petals of flowers has just started to scatter. Phoenix Hall at Byodo in Kyoto is a good example of utsuroi in Japanese architecture. It is considered to be the final form of Japanization of Chinese temple campus. The original Chinese temple campus is surrounded by the, is enclosed by the corridor, and there are pieces of important architecture in it. And that layout became flatter and flatter and flatter over the years of Japanization during Heian period. And eventually, these architecture pieces melted into the corridor and became a linear building. So in that sense, Phoenix Hall is a silhouette or the projection of the original Chinese three-dimensional campus layout. At the same time, people placed the large chunk of water during the Heian era in front of that building. So that's the images. So sort of you have two images of architecture at Phoenix Hall. Could you tell which is the true piece of architecture? Is it the one on the water, which is the reflection of the one on the land? Or could it be the land, one on the land, which is just the projection of the original architecture? So nothing is reliable. Everything is ephemeral. Of course, the idea of utsuroi, the changing space, is important in designing a Japanese gardens. Sakteiki was written in 11th century by Tachibana. Sakteiki was the oldest book on Japanese garden. It's like a, a guidebook or the textbook. And in it, he said that it is best to plant trees uh, that flowers in the east side of the garden and plant those that produce the beautiful color leaves on <coughs> the west. What he was suggesting is to create the garden so you enjoy the flowers of the trees with the rising sun and enjoy the colored leaves with the setting sun. The idea is that you need to design the garden so you enjoy not only the changing of the day, but changing of the season at the same time. You might then say that the Japanese dry garden, which is often referred as a Zen garden, is not changing. 
but is that so? The white gravels on the ground represent the, o the water, usually the ocean. So in your imagination, this landscape must be moving, must be changing. Let me go back to Joan, Solon style tea house. The windows in at, or at the Japanese tea houses not only create yugen, but also produce utsuroi. A tea ceremony you may or may not know, when performed in full, it takes as long as four hours or longer. Because it includes two different um, tea ceremonies, and then full course meal with sake. So, you know, it takes long. <laughs> if, you ha if the ceremony happens to start in the morning, the image on the left is the one that you see. It's in the morning, therefore it's darker. But because the sun is lower, you can see the clear silhouette of the grills that sits just outside of the shoji screen on the paper. But by the time that you have the second tea ceremony, the interior atmosphere changed a quite bit. The direction of the sun different, the lighting, the brightness is different. So two different conditions, right? And also, as a guest, between two different ceremonies, you as a guest were to go out to the tea garden, being under the different uh, lighting condition. If it is sunny, you're flooded uh, by the sunlight. So at a tea house, both the space as well as your movement, or I would say the literal or tea ceremony, are created so that the utsuroi, the changing of the space, would be emphasized. And these tea houses respond to the different kinds of utsuroi by keeping most of the interior elements uh, a temporary one. So here you see an example of setting for the nighttime ceremony to which the host brought in two different kinds of a temporary lighting. One is a candle, another is an oil lamp. In fact, the host of the tea ceremony is more or less like a producer of a theatrical performance. He is the one, or I should say she is the one who gets to choose which season of the year, which time of the day that you're going to have that performance, the tea ceremony, to have a different kind of changing space. And she is the one who gets to choose the guests, who are the actors in this performance. And then the host set the theme of the tea performance, usually related to the, the season, and uh, put together the different elements, like a hanging scrolls, flowers, flower-based tea utensils, to produce that um, production, the tea ceremony. Here you see um, ukiyo-e woodblock prints uh, made by the artist who was invited to the tea ceremony in very early springs. So I assumed, for example, the, um, this poem was on the hanging scroll. Let me also show you the actual example um, of this uh, utsuroi setting. This is the one in autumn. Therefore, the, hanging, the text on the hanging scroll said that the um, autumn lane is washing the colored leaves. And then you see the, uh, on the hanging basket wild uh, chrysanthemums, as well as a, a branch of maple. Then on the floor of this decorative alcove, you see the sandbox in the shape of maple leaf. This one, by the way, is a shofuso in Philadelphia, 
and the architect is Junso Yoshimura. The next concept is the last concept, which is the moving cell Michiyuki. I hope you remember that you cannot stop still in the water because water moves you. Michiyuki means traveling from one place to the other, but it also refers to the space, the physical distance that you covered by traveling at the same time that the time that you used for the traveling. So Michiyuki com is a combination of the action and space and time. And the, again, the Japanese people's fascination toward Michiyuki is apparent in many different forms of art. But especially so in ukiyo-e woodblock prints, this is, you know, the traveling image, and also in kabuki performance. The idea of this Michiyuki has a lot to do with the concept of yugen that we discussed. If yugen is about hiding something from somebody, then Michiyuki is about looking at it from the opposite. And let me explain that by using these two diagrams. These two diagrams represent two different paths in Cartesian layout. So they are like a map looking up from above, and each of it has an identical set of eight different places scattered, and both places, both spaces are dark. So these gray hatches represent the darkness. In Western and logical understanding, this pass A and pass B are completely different. But I would like to ask, are they really different if you are the traveler going through these two paths? So let us try starting with path A. You can start from left. So what you would do going into this darkness is that you go straight to place A. You make a slight right turn to go to B. You make a slight left turn to go to C and make another left turn to go to D. So that's the beginning of path A. Let us try the path B. You go straight to circle A, you make a right turn to go to B, you make a left turn to go to D, another left turn to go to D. So in both passes, what you did was went straight, right, left, left in the darkness. So if you are the traveler doing this traveling in the darkness, these two passes are almost identical, and that's the understanding of Michiyuki. In Michiyuki, Cartesian layout that you can only see from the above is not important. What are important is which places that you experienced, in which order, at what timing. And Japanese tea gardens represent this idea of yugen as well as Michiyuki very well because when you are in tea garden, you can only see a, a little glimpse of where you are going to. And I like to explain that by using another example of Hushin An Tea House. Fushin An Tea House is another Soan-style tea, uh, so tea house in Kyoto that belongs to Omote Senke, and it's, it's the most prestigious tea house. And this is the campus layout. The triangular shape on the left shows the gate to the property, and there's a, a front street going up and bottom. And Fushin An is the uh, rectangular on the right-hand side. It's the tiny one. The direct distance between the gate and Fushing An is probably about 100 feet. So it's a very small space. But if you ever try to make, do the traveling from the gate to Fushing An, 
you would feel it much longer pass. Because there are a couple of tr tricks played on you. The first trick was that this small property was divided into the different zones, each of which has a different design. So you experience different kinds of spaces that makes you feel that you, you walked a long way. At the same time, as you can see, the orange line is your path, is meandering, that actually prolong the physical and time distance that you would be traveling. And this long traveling, the long distance, is very important for the tea ceremony. Because to enjoy the tea ceremony in the serene, uh, contemplative atmosphere, you like to feel that you are so far away from the noisy cities where your daily activity belongs to. So this uh, distance, physical time distance, was created in a very intentional way. And I would guide you the different places within Fushingan uh, tea, ha tea House and Tea Garden. But let me start not from the triangle, but from the gate to the Tea Garden. Tea Garden is from here to the right. And the, in the next photo, you will be standing here. And by the time that you come here, you're supposed to go into the main part of the house wait there with your call with your fellow guests and you just come out so imagine that and that's what you see when you're standing there the gate even when you know right now it is closed and when it is open you can have a little glimpse of the space and what you see is a little glimpse not only because the gate is small but because it's open to the sideways. You see, when the space is this way, the gate is made into this way, to the sideways. So you, you see very little of it. And then when you come in to the tea garden, that's the first thing that you see. It's the waiting bench where you sit with your fellow guest and wait for your host to fetch you. And again, the waiting is important. This is the second waiting. You already waited in the main, main house. And this is a second waiting to prolong the distance from the city. And then this is the gate, only about eight feet from the bench. And your tea host would come to the other side of the gate and you would approach to it, and the host and you would bow each other. And here at this gate, again, that you can only see a glimpse of where you are going, because the gate is smaller. But what is interesting is that the gate is created in a peculiar way so that you need to move your head down. At the same time, you have to step up. That particular peculiar movement prepares you to the next space. At the same time, you notice that the design of the gate moves you. Water moves you. Now you are in a, a second part of the gate, which is the larger garden. Um, belongs to the larger tea house, larger than the Fushingan tea house. <laughs> Is that the nice background <laughs> music? Um, here we see the stepping stone, the large stepping stone that are changing the direction. So to be able to walk on it, you have to look down and go slowly. <laughs> Again, the water moves you. And eventually, you come close to the next gate. And again, you see only a small part of your destination. Hashi as a pili oh no, like a yugen. And I also would like you to notice the design of this gate 
Its roof is thatched by the cedar box, and its posts are made out of the、uh, lumber that still carries the box, and the doors are made of the cut bamboo. So these elements, these textures, are almost like a melt in, into the surroundings. Um, to make a very weak kind of a transparent kind of a, a periphery, hashi as the periphery. Finally, you are the inner garden of Shingan Tea House, and you notice how the plants are planted even closer to your body, and the stepping stones are smaller. So you have to walk even slower by looking down. And at the end of the、uh, stepping stone, you see the tsukubai、uh, basin. It's a, a basin made out of stone, where you cleanse your mouth and hands by squatting down. So your body movement is not only slowing down, but going down,、uh, literally, to the squatting position. Again, the water moves you. You are almost at the Fushin Am, but let me show you one more slice、um, to talk about how not only the tea houses but the tea garden.、Um, you find the intentional manipulation of the lighting. The diagram is not from Fushin Am; it's from Sang, another tea house in Kyoto. But the general idea is same. The diagram, the color, the The, the height of the column represents represent the brightness, and the middle part shows the the floor plan of the tea garden. So you notice how the general brightness of the space、um, starts from brighter to the darker when you approach to the tea、uh, to the tea house. At the same time, this decreasing brightness. Does not happen in a very smooth way. There are a couple of places where are, there are strong contrast, and these places are often aligned with,、uh, where you find the architectural elements like the、uh, bench, where your bodies also move. So, for example, this is the bench, and before and after the bench, you have a much brighter spot where are not covered by the the trees. And that's where your body moves, sitting down and sitting up. So now, finally, you are going go into the Fushin An. Fushin An does not have a veranda, but it does have a deep eave, on where you prepare your mind and body to go into the space. It has a tiny little crawling door. So you have to again squat down and open it, and then close in to this space. Just like Joan, it has a series of interesting windows to make a spotlight. Just as Joan, the architecture itself was kept simple so that it could accept the different elements、um, that the tea host will bring in to emphasize Uchiroi. In fact, if you crawl into the space from here, the first thing that you see is this decorative alcove, which is outside of this photo.、Um, in decorative alcove, you see this utsuroi element, like a hanging scroll and flowers. I also like to just make a comment about the smallness of this tea house. So, our style tea house are small. Smaller than nine feet by nine feet, for the good reason. If you sit on the floor of the space that is nine feet by nine feet, and only the ceiling height is six seven feet, the lowest part is six feet. Everything that you see is within the eight feet from your eyes. So every detail of the tea house, like the The glasses, the the fibers on the mat walls, the the pattern of the calligraphy on the scroll, you see everything, every natural element in the space. You perceive it. At the same time, 
because you'll be sitting for four hours in this small space, you are almost a, sort of a forced to perceive the different kinds of nature in the uh, nature of the space, the characteristic, the characteristic of the space that change over that four hours. So this is designed so so that you can feel that um, every uh, design elements that were put together by the team masters um, over that time of period. So I hope by now that you understand how going through the tea gardens and being a part of the tea ceremony is almost like a, um, being under the water. Your destination, the way you're going, are always hidden, you again, and you see the, a contrast of light and shadow. And your surroundings are always moving, not as a single mass, but a combination of different colors, ma and hashi. And in this space, these changes, different kinds of changes are emphasized, which is utsuroi. You are always moving, which is utsuro, uh, michiyuki. So today, I talked about how Japanese spatial concept make you lose the self-space boundary blur, thus quite possibly make you feel mindful. And the great part of this knowledge is that now you don't have to dive into the water to be mindful. You know, you get the knowledge, you can use it. And, uh, you know, the, the concept that I talked about, I understand, they are very abstract. But at the same time, as you saw in different examples, these are buildable concepts. And in fact, I admire the fact that they are abstract because precisely because they are abstract, you can translate them into the contemporary setting. And when you succeed in, in this translation, then the outcome does not stay on you and the space around you. It will influence the space of your families, of your co-workers, and, uh, and the society that you are part of it. And that translation is what I do every day. At my office with my partner here, by designing in fact, the translating these uh, concepts not only into the private spaces like homes or private gardens, but also a little more public space like the workplaces or the public gardens. And I really would like you to try that yourself too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kawai. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, Yoko will be joining us afterwards in the in Lyman Plant House, but I'd like to just open the floor. If students have any questions, maybe we have time for one question if any of the students want to ask anything. All right, we'll see you at Lyman. <laughs> thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Thank what a you. great talk.